Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> I'm very nervous. Uh, this is my first time talking in a developer yeah. meetup. Yeah. Uh, so here's my talk. I'm, the talk is titled Slaying the Dragon. Uh, and it's a guide to implementing your own programming language in Ruby. So hi, uh, my name is Jason. I'm from, I, I work at SourceClear. Uh, I graduated from NUS a year and a half ago, yeah. So, uh, and source clear, this is our logo. It's uh, source as in source code, clear as in crystal clear, yeah. So we are actually a uh, company that deal with uh, open source security. So we look at your, the open source library that you're using and uh, tell you whether any of the library is vulnerable and tell you how to fix it. Just in short, what we do. So you want to Google, just look for us. Um, so, yeah, like I said, so my talk is about how to implement, implement a language in Ruby. And uh, so what's the deal with uh, Slaying the Dragon? So apparently this book, known as the Dragon Book, is a very popular textbook in university compilers classes. So apparently people would think that, oh man, I have to go through this thick tomb to actually understand how to implement a programming language or a compiler. So, uh, but tonight I'm going to show you how uh, I will give you some resources, give you some guides to, and some uh, links to check out if you want to implement one. I'll actually show you how to implement one, uh, implement one in Ruby. And you might think, hey, why, why, am I, why should I implement a programming language? I'm a Rails developer. I don't even have to write a language. So first off, one big reason, it's fun. I mean, at least... <laughs> At least to me, it's fun, and, uh, and you get to understand how programming languages work. You get to understand things like uh, scoping rules, you get to understand things like uh, method invocation, you get, get to know what's garbage collection, you know what's mark and sweep, and what's, uh, what's the deal with the MRI's uh, virtual machine. So, and you will be answer, you'll be able to answer questions like, what is this error doing in my code? And you'll be able to answer, hey, which out of these two code snippets, which one is faster? Is it the case when? Uh, function or the hash lookup function? Does anyone know? Left or right? Hash or case when? Oh, sorry. Left or right? <laughs> yeah. Does anyone know? Yes, that's right. Hash. Yes, I won't give you a reason why. Go and look it up. <laughs> All right, so, and the language I'm going to show you how to implement is a Lisp. Does anyone know what's a Lisp? It's a programming language, by the way, not the. Yeah, brackets. <laughs> Does anyone know how to program in Lisp? Oh, no one. Oh my gosh. Are we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're using Ruby. So, uh, apparently, <laughs> so apparently, um, <laughs> I mean, you, you guys are using Ruby, right? I, I'm a Ruby pr programmer myself uh, uh, in, in my previous job. So, um, right now, I'm actually doing Java. But anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine my face after I go home, I'll be like, oh, why do I have to struggle with the compiler so much? Uh, and why do I, I can't define a function and pass it around? So, but anyway, back to Lisp. Uh, Ruby was actually based on Lisp, in case you don't know. Yes, woohoo, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, and uh, why are we implementing Lisp? So it's because it, it's actually super easy to implement. Alan Kay um, said this is the most powerful language in a world that can be defined in a single page of code. And the reason why it's so simple is because it's very easy to lex and parse. So in many other languages, you will actually need a special tool, lots of regex, uh, you will have to define grammar rules. Uh, it's really complicated, but for Lisp, it's actually very simple because the code is actually the data you want to uh, represent in memory. Uh, and we call this, some people call this homo iconic. Uh, in fact, someone ever, ever told me uh, Ruby is homo iconic, but uh, I will leave that to debates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, there are tons of guides online. There are actually like, lots of guides out there to teach you how to write a Lisp in, uh, um, yourself. Yeah. So uh, apparently, I think like, writing a Lisp is like some kind of write a passage for most programmers. Uh, you, 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 won't, you can't say, hey, I'm some expert programmer without saying I wrote a Lisp before. <laughs> how cool is that? So, yep. So, first off, uh, there is this guide. 
uh, by Peter Novick. Peter Novick is this guy who wrote this uh, very famous AI textbook. He, what else did he do? Yeah, he was the guy who did this AI class back in 2011 with uh, Sebastian Trung. Tr yeah, Trung, yes, I can't pronounce that. Yeah, but the, so Sebastian is the guy behind uh, Udacity. I almost got it wrong. Yes. Yeah, so, and uh, yeah, the AI class was all that that started the MOOC craze back in 2012. Yeah, and another, another guide that you should check out is build a list, buildyourownlist.com. So this guy actually wrote an online book uh, where he teaches you how to write a list in less than a thousand lines of C code. <laughs> so just in case you will be like, I, I feel like writing C, my Ruby is too slow, I want to write C, I want to be a Methodist and write C. So you can actually learn C by learning how to write Lisp. <laughs> uh, write a list in C. So, but um, this, this one, this guide is actually very cool. So um, this guy actually has a repository uh, that's called MAL. M-A-L, which stands for make a Lisp. He has a repository, repository that's an implementation of Lisp that contains 44 uh, programming languages implementing that Lisp. So we have implementation in uh, Kotlin, in Haskell, in Bash even. Someone even did it. And in MEL itself. Yeah, there's even a Ruby implementation. So um, he has a very nice uh, language agnostic guide as well. So it's to teach people how to uh, write Lisp in uh, another language, maybe I don't know, fourth or factor, or if you're, or even the a, a, any other esoteric language that you might know. So uh, I'm going to follow Mel's implementation of Lisp, and um, and I'm going to teach you how to write Lisp right now because uh, the reason why we implement Lisp, another reason is because it's very easy to understand and you can actually learn it in less than ten minutes. Yeah. So, um, and like in any Lisp, like just like in Ruby, uh, Lisp has a repo, read, eval, print loop. It's like an interactive command line shell kind of thing where you can actually type things and something come out. So it's just like RRB that we are very familiar with. So Mel, here's just pretend this is like an interpreter. So let's say if I type this into the, in, into the interpreter, what will come out? Eight. Eight. Six plus. Oh yeah, eight. <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> Right, so apparently, uh, that's right, you guys know, know a bit of this, right? Yeah, so very good, very good. So apparently, so this thing that is enclosed in parentheses are uh, called uh, forms, list forms. Can you guys see that? Okay, I hope you can. Okay, it's called list forms. It's kind of like an expression. An expression is usually uh, enclosed in a bracket. And also, you have expressions for like numbers, strings, and booleans. And uh, what do I get if I type this in? Negative four, that's right. And it's not four because it's four minus eight. All right, thanks. Um, what about this? Six. Yep, six. And this? True. <laughs> All right, and a complicated one. What do you think I'll get? 42, yes, that's the answer. Right, and this is actually um, a way for you to define a function. Just like in Ruby, uh, you can actually define function and pass it around. And um, so in your form, your first element is actually a fn star. Your second element are your params, the parameters, your former parameters. And your third element is your function body. Just like in Ruby, you use lambda, and pass in a block so that x in those things, I don't know what you call that, is the former parameter and the rest of the block is your lambda body or your function body or your block body. So yeah, and uh, what comes up from our interpreter is actually a function value and I can actually call that function directly by actually enclosing it in another pair of brace, brace not braces, parentheses and passing in my argument. So my first element would be uh, a function that I want to call and the second element would be uh, the arguments I want to pass in. So it's just like Ruby. Yeah, and you just call dot call on your lambda and pass in your uh, parameters. So, and I can also uh, define and give it a name. So I have my function, I'm going to give it a name sq. And now uh, I have given my function the name sq. So I can call sq8, I'll get, which is growing 8, by the way. And I'll get 64. So now you'll know this. Give yourself. Oh, thank you, thank you. Right. Okay. Very good. 
So, but before we dive in, uh, before we actually implement Lisp in Ruby, uh, I'm going to deviate from Mel now, because uh, the guide, by the way. So the guide actually teaches you how to implement a language, uh, in implement an interpreter. But I'm going to teach you, I'm going to show you uh, how to actually compile. So uh, interpreter is actually, uh, what we actually read uh, the language and actually evaluate it in the host language. It doesn't actually compile into any like machine code or any byte code. But I'm going to compile it and I'm going to actually compile to Rubinius byte code. Yes, oh. Rubinius. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, Rubinius has been like uh, some, <laughs> it's very uh, controversial. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch the controversial stuff. <laughs> Uh, nothing about versioning and uh, COCs, huh? <laughs> right? So <laughs> let's stick to uh, the topic, right? So Rubinus, Rubinus, you might heard of it. It's actually um, an implementation of Ruby, um, and it uses the uh, LLVM's JIT compiler. JIT stands for Just in Time Compiler. I want to explain why is it. If you're interested, go and look it up. Yes, and apparently it's not just a um, language. Uh, it's not just an implementation implementation of Ruby. It's also a language platform. So language implementers can actually use Rubinius to implement a language on top of the virtual machine. So I've been using the word virtual machines and bytecode. You might be thinking, no, what the heck is a virtual machine? So a virtual machine is a machine that is virtual. <laughs> so uh, it's an abstract machine. <laughs> so it's a machine that actually sits on top of your OS. And um, it will actually read like bytecode. Okay, like the virtual machine's bytecode and actually compile it into native code. Other than that, it also handles garbage collection and threads and some of the stuff like that. So, um, and one nice, one very nice side effect is that people can actually write like multiple high level languages and compile it to the bytecode and be able to run it on a single runtime on whatever platforms. You, you don't have to care whether you're running on x86, ARM, or Windows. OS X, Linux. So this is kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, any Java programmers here? You're probably not here, of course. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> uh, that was a trick. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so this, you can actually swap this out and put JVM here, uh, the Java virtual machine, and you can actually put like Clojure, Java, Scala, Groovy, Kotlin, whatever. Yep. So similar. And all right, let's dive in. So um, like I said, we're going to actually like, write a language on top of uh, Rubinia's virtual machine. And uh, since it's a language platform, we can actually customize uh, the, uh, the compiler pipeline very, very easily. This is something we can't do in MRI. Yeah, tell Mats that. OK, so <laughs> yeah, so this is the compilation pipeline of Rubinia's. So um, it actually takes in either a file or a string. and out comes compound method. Compound method is just like something like a single unit or compilation that the virtual machine can execute uh, directly. So, um, so in this pipeline, there's actually two things that we're going to uh, customize. First is the parser. That's because we're actually reading a different high-level language right now. We're not going to do like a, um, like a method call dot something plus something. So we're not going to do that. We're actually doing a like plus my var to prefix notation. So we're going to change the parser. That's the first thing. The second thing we're going to change is actually an AST. Why? It's because when we hand off the AST objects to the rest of the uh, pipeline, the rest of the pipeline will actually call the bytecode method on this AST nodes, AST objects. So um, this is actually very similar to um, MRI, by the way. So I was uh, listening to, uh, who is that? Aaron, Aaron Pedersen's talk. So he actually, uh, I heard that and I thought, hey, this is very similar to Rubinus. Yeah, so what they do is that they have a bytecode method each, on each of these uh, ASD nodes, and each of these ASD nodes know how to generate bytecode for itself. Right, so, oh, yeah, the parser in ASD tree, the abstract syntax tree, by the way, that's what ASD stands for, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to explain what those two do later on. Don't worry, you'll be like, huh, what's this? Don't worry. All right, so the parser, uh, first off, okay, so there's three parts to the parser, the tokenizer, the reader, and the parsing logic. In other languages, I mean, you might have went through some kind of compilers class, you saw, you see, what, tokenizer? Oh no, I have to implement like a thousand language, a thousand lines of code implementation? No, note it. I'll show you how simple it is to tokenize uh, Ruby code, oh, not Ruby, Lisp code. Yeah, so the tokenizer, what it does is actually take an input string or a piece of code 
and actually turns it into an array of tokens. So uh, tokens are like, you know, my var shouldn't be m comma y comma underscore. It should be by itself. That's a token. I call that a token. And 42 shouldn't be like separate. It should be together. Like I, I as like how I would read as a digit. So these are tokens. And uh, to do it, it's actually very simple. It's just one line of rejects. <laughs> yeah. So what I do is that I'll just <laughs> repeatedly apply the reject regular expressions onto uh, the input string and put it into an array. Yes. Please don't try to parse. Hey, what is this? How come? No, please don't try to do that. I, I also haven't looked at it, but I just use it, copy and paste from the internet, and it works. Yeah, like what we always do, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, and, um, and this step is actually very similar to what we call lexing in Ruby. And if you have a Ruby interpreter, RRB, or Pry, you can actually do this right now. So we just have to require Ripper. I don't know why they call it Ripper, but uh, just require Ripper and call dot lex on Ripper and pass in the, the string, the Ruby code that you want to see tokens for. And it will return you all this stuff, which are actually the tokens in your code. All right, so uh, now that we have transformed our code to tokens, now we can actually uh, go on to the next phase, which is the reader. The reader, what it does, basically, it actually takes uh, all this, this in tokens, the list of tokens, or array of tokens, and turn it into this nasty looking thing. But it's actually, uh, it's actually an array uh, that represents what the code actually means. Right? So uh, it actually adds a, bit, a little bit more meaning to your code. So um, people call this S expressions. If you actually like, look it up, uh, actually Ruby actually does this internally, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, yeah, you look at gems like Ruby AST and Ruby Parser, they actually um, represent Ruby code in, a, in the form of uh, S, S expressions. That's because Mats based Ruby on this. Yeah, so, and to do actually that, to actually change uh, tokens to our Ruby array that represent the code, uh, we have to look at the grammar. You'll be like, hey, you know, some programming language grammars are like two pages, three, or even like 10,000 lines of code long. But in our mouse grammar, there's only three, there's only three rules. So um, this is what we call a grammar definition. It's actually very simple to understand. Okay, what it's trying to say is that a form is either a list or an atom. So you can read it like, uh, like your normal code. So a form is actually like an expression in ML. So it's either a list or an atom. And a list is, um, is actually a bunch of forms. So that's why form star, uh, a, a sequence of forms, enclosed in either parentheses or square brackets. And atoms, atoms are just simply your text, strings, uh, numbers, and Boolean values. Right, so to implement the reader to, to read like um, forms is actually very simple. So I just need to like check whether the first uh, token is actually a parenthesis or not. If it is, I'll call read list. If it's not, just call read form. Simple as that. So as for the second rule, the second rule actually will correspond to this function, right, it's read list. And this read list, what it does is that you just call read form repeatedly on it until it encounters a closing parenthesis. That's it. And we have our last function. This is like dead simple. So we just a bunch of uh, case when cases. Yeah, and we will return a pair uh, that represent what the token is. So if it's an integer, uh, my first element is a, is a symbol. And the second element is the token itself. So just to recap, what we have done is that we have turned a piece of code into a uh, stream of tokens, array of tokens, and into array that represents um, the data structure. The, the data structure that represents what the code is in a form of Ruby array. All right. Hey, take a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now on to the passing logic. So what we're going to do is that from those, uh, from the S expression, we're going to turn it into AST. Extract syntax tree. All right, so who knows what is this? All right, yes. Finally, some people understand what I'm trying to say. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. So, um, so apparently, um, this. So, what's an AST? So, I'll give you an example. So, um, this expression or form here, uh, this will, will be represented in the AST form by this tree. And a tree is like, uh, uh, it's like, 
an upside down tree. I don't know. I assume you know what trees are, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we call, why I call it upside down tree? Because the root of the tree is at the top. Yep. So, uh, so what's at the root? The add node, right? Yes, okay, right. So, the add node is uh, at the root, and we call this the children, children nodes. So, uh, these boxes are called nodes. The whole thing is called a tree. So, they are related by like um, lines. So, which means like, so this guy is the children of add node. The symbol node is as children of add node. So, um, that's a tree. So um, it actually represents a bit of the structure of the code and even a semantic, in other, in other words, the meaning of code already. So um, the, the left hand side of my add operation is the symbol, which is my var, and the right hand side is the, the integer uh, 42. Yeah, and it's actually a Ruby object. Okay, this is what I want eventually, so that I can actually invoke or instantiate it like this. Right, uh, a more complex example is this, is an if uh, statement or if, not real statement, an if form. Um, so for an if node, uh, an if AST, they will look like this. So on the most left hand side is children of the if node is uh, the conditional. The next, uh, the one in the middle is the then branch, which is the, what if it's true, then I'll do this, then branch I call it. And the else branch, if the condition is false, I evaluate the else branch. Yeah, so, and this is the, the object I want to instantiate. Uh, if I want to instantiate as object, this is what I do. Yep. So, um, I can, I also have assessors uh, that I want to define on this uh, object. So, if I call condition, I should get a less than node. If I call then branch, I should get 42. The else branch, I should get 88. 88 because, like, Chinese New Year's coming. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so to parse it is just um, okay. It's actually um, kind of nasty. I wouldn't say nasty, but it's just uh, basically it's um, uh, two mutually fun mutually recursive function. Uh, I won't go into detail, but uh, I'll show you the easier mutually <laughs> easier to understand mutually recursive function. One of it. So uh, what do you do? I'll just look at the type of the pair. I'll just uh, call the I just instantiate an object for it. Uh, if it's a boolean, instantiate a true or false. If it's a symbol, I just uh, create a symbol node, right? So if you want to check out the other uh, function, go to my rep repository. I'll show you the link at the end. Uh, you can star it. Give me fifty stars. I'll appear on. <laughs> I'll appear on the website. Okay, so um, now, so now that we have our AST, uh, we're gonna define the bytecode method on our AST nodes. So I need to talk about bytecode a little bit. So I'm, am I still on time? Okay, thank you. So, um, so in Rubinus, uh, the virtual machine is actually a stack-based virtual machine, just like uh, MRI. Okay, what is stack-based? It just means that the instructions operands are on the stack. So, but uh, for your x86, your Intel computer, the operands are in the form of registers, the stuff that is very close to the CPU. Um, so, um, let me try to explain what's a stack-based VM. It's actually very simple. It's simpler to explain than uh, the register-based uh, machine. So, let's say if I want to calculate one plus two. So, I'll have uh, the stack of the virtual machine over there on your right, and uh, the instructions to do it on the left. So, I need to push one onto the stack, Push two, all right, and I need to add. So I need, I need to execute the add instruction. So what, at this point, what it does is that the add instruction will pop uh, both um, operands off the stack and put the result onto the stack. I'm sorry. Yeah, so the result will be three. You'll find the result on top of the stack so, so that the next instructions can actually read the result, whatever it may be. So, um, and if you want to look at uh, Rubinian's bytecode, you can actually do this. Yeah, let's just call this, uh, execute this command, and you'll be able to see that, hey, oh, it's pushing one, f one, two, three, and it's pushing 42, and executing and sending the plus message to the integer object. Yeah, so uh, you can do this in MRI, by the way, so you just go and Google, like what we do every day, and look for the first stack, over link, stack overflow link. Yes, right, so, um, and so now, 
I'm going to show you how we're going to generate bytecode for our AST. So uh, just a quick reminder. So now we have um, um, have our AST nodes. Now we're going to actually define the bytecode method on the AST nodes. So over here, I have an integer node. So an integer node uh, is actually a subclass of the node class. The node class simply is just a class that has a bytecode method. So all the nodes, the subclass of the node class just have to define, uh, read, override the bytecode method. Override, right? Ruby has overread. Oh, okay. I'm a Java programmer. <laughs> 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 okay. So um, here, here, as you see here, um, the integer nodes bytecode method is uh, position, which tells, uh, gives you some debugging in output. And also, I'm going to push the integer to the stack. Simple as that. So um, you, what you see here, g.push underscore in is actually a DSL offered by Rubinius. What's cool about Rubinius uh, bytecode is that they actually have a DSL in Ruby for you to write Rubinius bytecode. It's like mind blowing for me. So, and, uh, and what's cool, cooler is that this bytecode actually just look the same as the actual bytecode in what you saw just now. Yeah. So, um, so for the integer, like I said, we just have to push the integer to the stack. If it's an add node or add operator, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the bytecode method on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So because the left-hand side and the right-hand side are also themselves node objects, and my add operator may be nested. So like I might be adding an um, expression uh, which is nested. So, but, I know, but I don't know what it is. It may be a symbol. It may be an integer. But what I know is that it's a node object. That's why I'm going to call bytecode on it. So what, once I call those bytecode methods, I'm going to send the add um, message. So uh, just in case you guys don't know, like um, Ruby is based on uh, Smalltalk, uh, another language. So Smalltalk, just um, how they actually do OO is that they actually send messages. So that's why uh, this is a legacy passed down right now. That's why Ruby inherited this and actually used uh, send to call, make method calls. All right. So and uh, for a more complicated example, I, oh, you can't even see this. Yeah, just to show that it's very complicated. But uh, you just have to look at the bytecode. Can you guys see? Yes. I, all right. OK, so you just have to look at the bytecode uh, method. So what we're going to generate is for the if expression. So the if expression, just to remind you, has the condition, the else, the then branch, and the else branch. So if your condition is true, what do I evaluate? Yeah. Then. Yeah, if it's false, else. else. Thank you very much. Yes, you guys are still awake. So what you're going to do is that, uh, how I'm going to do the, um, the bytecode generation is I need to create two labels, um, one for the end of the if expression, if else block, and one for the else block. All right? So once I've generated these labels, OK, so I forgot to ex explain what's label. So labels are like um, places for your go-to instructions to go directly to. Yeah, so um, go-to instructions are kind of like a flow control for you to jump. So you can imagine like uh, in instructions will be read line by line. OK, but when I encounter go-to instruction, I should just go to the, the place where the label is set. So instead of just going line by line. So and um, in Rubinia's bytecode, Instruction set you can go to if true and you can do like go to if false, which I'll show you later on. And um, I will set these labels one at the start of the else, um, one at the start of the else branch, and one at the end of the if else block. So uh, then I'm going to call the bytecode method on the condition. So the condition should actually evaluate to either a true or false value. So and uh, I'll go to, if it's false, do the else block. It reads like English. Thank, thank God for DSLs. So, and, and yeah, so if it's false, I'll just go to the else block and call bytecode on it. And I'll just get out of the if else block. But if it's true, I'm going to um, execute bytecode, the bytecode method on the then branch and go to the end. I'm going to skip the uh, else branch entirely. All right, so when you define the bytecode method for the rest of the nodes, like def, fn, uh, let, and a symbol, you have a working programming language. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, obviously, um, 
I'm running short of time. I, 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 I don't have uh, much time to actually explain to you uh, the rest of it, but this is the very high level overview of like, how we're going to actually implement a language or even compile a language, actually, in this case. So uh, if you need help, so there are some places to actually look, look at. So go to this one. I really recommend you to go and try it. You can actually do it in a weekend or two uh, to actually implement a Lisp in Ruby uh, or whatever language you're secretly learning. You don't have to tell us. Maybe Java. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so go and look at Mel. Yeah, so uh, like I said, he has a very nice written guide. Uh, it's language agnostic. It's very easy to understand. If you, even if you don't understand, just look at one of the implementations on the repo. All right, and this one. Uh, so this one actually heavily inspired me. So this is a, re this is a language done by a bunch of... Uh, uh, so this is a language that compiles Rubinus by code. Okay, and it's done by a bunch of beginners from Rails Girls. Uh, they did it over summer. So yeah, they, they, so it's over at this repository, so you can check it out how they actually do done it. So, but the language they are compiling is not Lisp; it's actually a more complicated language, and they have a, a working parser to to actually parse their language. They use one of the parser to uh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it's in Ruby. Yeah, so you can take a look at it. And uh, and if you plan to like compile to Ruby and Spike code, you should look at the instruction set. It's over here. So this is the website where you can find all the instructions in Rubyness. And lastly, uh, start my repo. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I, so this is an implementation of Mel in uh, Rubinus bytecode. So I call it Melody. Just, I mean, Ruby programmers, we have very weird names for our gems. I know. Come on. Nokogiri. <laughs> all right. Are there any questions? That's all I have. Yes. What kind of situations would be beneficial to use Lisp if you're doing it, if you're coding a root or a when your, when your company forces you to write on the JVM, <laughs> I, would, I would use Clojure. <laughs> My colleagues are laughing. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was like, <laughs> yeah, um, because, uh, okay. The, 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 real question, uh, the real answer is, uh, I think in this day and age, uh, uh, I mean, if you want to use, uh, if you want to kill yourself with parentheses, <laughs> you can write in Lisp. Uh, I, I haven't seen a very good uh, Lisp implementation nowadays. Uh, the best uh, out there is probably Clojure uh, or even or Dr. Racket, but I haven't seen a, a, a real, like, a real world production uh, code. Yeah, that is, um, there's, that has actually said that this is that justifies the use of Lisp, yeah. And um, the only right now I see Lisp as something that is fun to implement for a weekend and uh, something, and I think it's easy to teach. Uh, I actually taught a, a workshop for CDAC. You guys, the Singaporeans, you know, like fifty cent. We go to we pay, goes to CDAC. So, so I taught uh, Racket, another uh, dialect of Lisp. Uh, to a uh, bunch of uh, secondary school kids, and, and uh, some of them actually managed to get it. Um, the problem is that they have to; they didn't know that the, the brackets are above nine and zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they'd be like, "Hey, I'm pressing nine, but nothing comes out." You no, know? like they have to press shift. Yeah. So, I, I think it's a very simple language that I can teach in less than uh, thirty minutes or so. It's easier than JavaScript. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Uh, so we're running a bit short time, so if you have any more questions, just look for Jason afterwards. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there any, any more time? If there's no, no more time, uh, I won't talk about it. But anyway, so <laughs> another one, one, one very nice tidbit about Lisp is that this guy, uh, he's called Matt Knox, I think. So he's actually a Rubyist, working at Twitter right now. So in his past life, he was writing adware for this company. Uh, the reason why he was hired because he knew a bit of C, and uh, he was hired to write C to kick off uh, some viruses that were disabling their, their adware on uh, their Windows machines. So uh, every time, like uh, a competitor, that, that is, he, he's so good at it that the company actually asked him to kick off uh, their ad company's competitors. Uh, and yeah, so what he did is that uh, he actually did something very impressive. He actually uh, wrote the adware in Scheme, a uh, dialect on Lisp. 
And the reason why is because every time he need to kick off someone from their, their victim's machine, he had to write a C binary, which is uh, very painful. So what he did, he, needed, he, he thought he needed something configurable, something Turing complete. So he actually shipped a tiny scheme. It's actually a 20K executable uh, and um, onto like the victim's machine. <laughs> So, uh, and every time he needed to kick off a competitor, he just need to upload the scheme code to the server and the competitors and viruses will actually go dark. So he claims that he has shipped uh, the most scheme runtime on this planet than anyone else. Yeah, so just a nice tidbit for you to read uh, if you're interested. I'll post the slides. Yeah, have, have fun implementing a language inside another language. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>